speaker view at this point in time. And Kelly, you will let us know, let me know by text or whatever, if for some reason you're not hearing me, but want to welcome you to the second virtual trip in which the Outreach Foundation is kind of making up for lost time with the fact that we were not able to be on the road in 2020, but we still lean forward into the opportunities that God may present for us to partner with our churches face-to-face, -face, even later this year, but to fill in that gap, to give you an opportunity of what it's like to travel with the Outreach Foundation on a, on a trip. And so, as I've said, when I did one of these last year, this is not a, a, an attempt to go in-depth into the mission and ministry that we're involved in in Egypt, although we will touch on it, but also to kind of give a sense of literally what it means to be on the road with the Outreach Foundation. So some of the fun, some of the flavor, um, some of the fabulous sites that we will see. Um, as I said, we are joined by Tim Norton, who's going to co-host this week, co-host this virtual trip with me. And Tim, I'm delighted to say, is also a new trustee of the Outreach Foundation. But one of the things that I want to, to point out to you um, is that we start each one of these virtual trips with an opportunity to be welcomed to our host country by partners in that place. And so I want to introduce you before they come on to the people that you're about ready to meet, not literally, but figuratively as if you were in Egypt like this team that you see here. And that is to Dr. Tharwan Wakba, who's going to be greeting us from Cairo Seminary, the Evangelical Theological Seminary in Cairo, and one of his students there, Amin Magdi, who you see here in a picture with his fiance, Sarah. So I'm going to stop screen sharing right now and going to introduce you to Tharwat, and we're going to mute and let Tharwat bring his greetings to us along with Amin. Hello, my friends. It's a pleasure to see you all in, in this uh, virtual trip. We hope not to have it virtual. We hope to see you all here with us in Egypt and enjoy the fellowship, enjoy the Egyptian food, the Egyptian people, the Egyptian worship style. We miss you uh, a lot. We send you our greetings, our love uh, from the church in Egypt. Yes, it is very tough, very hard time not seeing you, not to meet uh, each other in a regular way. Uh, but we trust that out of this, God has his plan and he has his blessings out of the troubles. Uh, the church in Egypt is suffering, but full of hope and, and full of, of, of peace. And, and uh, our pastors and ministers are working very hard in such special time in the history of the church in Egypt. Church planting is taking place, church buildings is active, discipleship groups are uh, taking place. Uh, we had a, a prayer conference as usual in on the internet in, in, in a way that we didn't expect to be successful uh, before, but it doesn't equal meeting our brothers and sisters face to face. So we hope and we plan to see you in November, if not before. <laughs> and I encourage you to, to sign in and to come and, and visit us. Here in the seminary, uh, we are doing uh, our ministry online, most of it. Uh, we miss seeing the students, but we meet on, well, with them on uh, Zoom. And if we have time, like Amin is here, he was leading uh, the worship in the chapel uh, today uh, with uh, faculty and staff. Unfortunately, students were, were only on Zoom. So Amin is here with me and he sends his greetings. Hello, it's a pleasure to meet you. And uh, Amin is a fourth year student. He will uh, graduate in a few months from now. And we he was assigned to uh, go to a church in 6th of October city in Giza. And you know, his father is a pastor in Upper Egypt in the city of Naga Hamed. I pray that our time will be a blessing and Marilyn has a great plan for us and, uh, and Tim to take us on a trip alongside the, uh, the, the river, alongside the Egypt 
uh, Egypt churches uh, and, and the seminary and food and drinks and everything. So I pray that our time will be uh, enjoyable and we will have a great trip together. Welcome to Egypt. Thank you, Tharwat. And as Tim um, starts his screen share portion of our journey through Egypt, a um, couple of things to be aware of. A reminder is that we are recording this so that if you know people that wanted to be part of it but could not, we will soon have this up online in all of its raw beauty. And the second thing is in your chat room, you can start writing questions and Kelly Rickard, who is our communication person working behind the scenes, will be kind of collating those um, questions so that we have time at the end to answer those. We might also answer some live, but as I said, go to that chat room. Kelly is going to take that those questions from you. And now I want to turn begin by turning things over to Tim Norton. Mm -hmm. Hey everybody, so my name is Tim and just uh, delighted to be with you guys. I, I, I tell Marilyn this uh, somewhat jokingly, but somewhat very seriously. Uh, it can be an intimidating thing to think about traveling to Egypt, especially if you've never been to the Middle East and what is it gonna be like? Can I actually do this sort of thing? And, and my encouragement, my role as the co-host is to lower the bar so much that it, by the time I'm done talking, you think if that guy can do it, I certainly can as well. So my, um, my hope is to paint a picture of what the experience is like as we go through uh, our time in Egypt. And if you travel with the Outreach Foundation, uh, you're going to realize that the Synod of the Nile uh, has a lot of initiatives and impact on the evangelical, the Presbyterian church in Egypt. But where we zoom in is on one of two things. And the first thing is a new church development that looks like church planting, that looks like sending pastors into um, uh, dying churches and seeing new life come. And so I want you to imagine that you've arrived at the Cairo airport uh, and you get a quick uh, short night's sleep because you arrive late with all of the time zone changes and uh, you get up and travel 50 miles north to a, a city called Zagazig. And this is the church uh, that you arrived to. You see that it's behind a gated wall. Uh, and uh, inside the church, you see uh, a, a revitalization effort is underway. Pastor Wael Nashat has been there for five or six years and uh, has been a graduate of the seminary under Dr. Tharwat's tutelage. And you can see that this uh, building was established in the 1920s, has been around in the community for a while, but is starting to see new life uh, thriving in Zagazig. And uh, I arrive, not quite sure what to expect, and I meet um, a guy named George, as well as a ton of uh, church leaders. This is just a snapshot of some of the leadership, uh, as well as the team uh, from Winston-Salem, which was the church that I was serving at the time when I went on my uh, trips to Egypt. And George was a bodybuilder, um, one of the leaders of the church uh, uh, and a leader of their evangelism uh, ministry in particular. And the only thing that George said to me so far uh, in, the, in the day was, I am no sugar, which just he knew that uh, he didn't want to eat any of the desserts. So the arrangement was that I would eat the desserts for him for the glory of the Lord. And so um, that, that was how we connected. But when we sat down to talk about what it would look like for us to come and visit Zagazig regularly, George, uh, who had just been a playful, fun guy, got very serious, uh, and the question he asked was, are these Americans going to get in the way of our evangelism? And it was at that point that I realized we're not coming here with mission uh, to, to, uh, to define mission as what the West brings to the rest, as if we're coming here to do everything <laughs> for these Egyptians that need our help as Americans perhaps quite the opposite, that we were coming to be encouraged and challenged in our own faith and in our own way that we uh, uh, engage in evangelism and mission back home, we could learn from our brothers and sisters in Egypt. And uh, one of the main emphases of the Outreach Foundation is that mission is first about um, building relationships. It's about standing with our global church siblings around the world, getting to know them, hearing from them, learning from them, and supporting what God has called them to do. Uh, and uh, it's, it's easy to think about short-term trips, 
um, about that are project based short term trips that are about what we bring to the people we're visiting. And I like to say that that's sort of like going to visit your mom, um, showing up, mowing the yard and leaving without having a conversation or a meal or uh, any kind of time together. Uh, you're getting things out of order. <laughs> There's a time and a place for providing serving uh, or service, but the emphasis day in and day out should be on building relationships. My wife, Kendra, uh, traveled with me to Egypt. She's a pastor in Eco as well. And uh, she had a conversation uh, with Farah, who the year before um, sat down with uh, my teammate and I and said, I am a minority of a minority. Uh, there are, in Egypt, 10% of the country are culturally Christian. 10% of that 10% are evangelical or Presbyterian. And I feel like I live in a world of darkness, but this church brings the light of Christ into my life. And it was at that point that I realized uh, Farah doesn't need us to come do much for her. She needs us to stand with her, to pray with her, to celebrate that Jesus uh, and, and this church are an embodiment of the gospel to her and, and to provide her with a visual demonstration that uh, this God who is so big and so vast uh, loves her so specifically that people from around the world see her and know her and are with her. That's what it feels like to travel with the Outreach Foundation. You sit in homes, the, the top right corner is Elder Emgad, and uh, you see four generations of Egyptians in one house. You hear the stories of what life has been like in the city, what they are praying for, what they are longing to see changed, what they are proud of and want to celebrate with you. Uh, it's a whirlwind of relational depth. And uh, when you travel with the Outreach Foundation, the thing that you will leave with uh, is a, a heart filled with stories of what God is doing around the world. And I encourage you all to, to think about what it would be like to have names and faces and relationships formed in an intense way over a little less than a two week period as we engage uh, our brothers and sisters in Egypt. I'm going to turn it over to Marilyn, and she's going to continue to share some of the next stops that we might make on our trip. Thank you, Tim. As Tim mentioned, one of the ways that Outreach Foundation um, focuses on work in Egypt is with new church development. The Synod of the Nile, our Presbyterian family there is engaged in many different ministries, but the but new church development is one of the ones, one of the ways we come alongside that synod, inviting congregations like those represented here to join with us in that work. But our other core partner in this ministry is the seminary in Cairo, ETSC, Evangelical Theological Seminary in Cairo. This becomes our base of operation, by the way, when we are there, staying at the seminary for a number of days from which to explore the city of Cairo, but specifically to get to know the mission and ministry of this leadership training center that has been around for over 150 years. Tharwat, of course, is one of the faculty members that leads that initiative. We always spend time with Tharwat while we're there. And for the past almost two decades, Dr. Atav Gendi, who has been the president of the seminary in Cairo, he will soon step down to leave the presidency to return to teaching but one of the my, one of my favorite memories always of being with Dr. Atif is being with um, being in his office and seeing this incredible picture on his wall which was one of the first pictures of the seminary or of the synod in Egypt where you see in that front row four of the pastors standing behind them four of the elders which really give you a flavor for the for the ancientness for the oldness for the roots of this part of our Presbyterian family one Mayor, of the, could you share your screen oh I thought I was hold on hold on Hold on, what, what went wrong? Tim, are you not seeing my screen? I don't think we are. Okay, there you are now. Okay, friends, let me go back. You heard me, did you hear me, Tim? 
Yes, we heard you, okay. we just didn't see the screen. Okay, let me go through a beautiful picture of the seminary. I apologize, I think when Tim got on, it knocked me off at the same time, but of this wonderful place, our kind of our base of operation that we have here in Egypt when we're there. We are the guests of the seminary, our base of operation. And as I said, meeting with people like Tharwat, meeting with Dr. Atif, this is this incredible picture I was referencing of one of the first pictures of the presbytery gathering together four pastors, four elders. It gives you a sense of the depth of this family of faith that we call Presbyterians in this place. Because the seminary is located in a very dense urban area of Cairo, there's not a lot of room for them to spread out as they grew. And so they have grown upwards. And so there is this large tower block on the grounds of the seminary that is a multi-purpose place for the student rooms, for the dining halls, um, for meeting rooms, but it also houses rooms for guests like, uh, like us. And so when we come, we always stay on campus for a number of days. And one of the beauties of that is it gives us a chance to interface with the seminary community, the students, their families, um, the seminary professors and staff. We are literally part of that family. One of the, one of the years that we were there, our visit corresponded with kind of their annual family day where everybody comes for a big potluck dinner for fun and games and we participated in one of the great traditions of Egypt which is everybody gets a piece of sugar cane to gnaw on um, and I discovered that this has kind of the same effect upon your teeth as does a milk a, a milk dud bone um, given or milk bone given to dogs, it is also good for kind of cleaning your teeth. So it, it, it kind of touches on a, a variety of different purposes. But one of the things that gives us great joy is to be able to spend time with the students to get to know them. You see Amin who started out our gathering together there in the left hand corner. And one of the wonderful ways that the seminary has found to help us really get to know these students well is they'll choose two or three of them and they will send the outreach foundation team and two or three of those students out on a felucca boat ride, literally out onto the Nile River to float along for a couple of hours to share a potluck dinner together, a picnic dinner, I should say, and really begin to hear the stories of these students of where they have come from, what has been their call to ministry, what is their aspiration to serve this community of faith, how they see Christ coming alive in the way that he has called them. And as I said, it is a wonderful way um, for us to go deep, to build relationships with these students and to get an insight into what God is doing as he continues to build his church through leadership development. And so now I'm going to turn things back over to Tim. <clears throat> Thanks, Marilyn. So, you know, when we read in the book of Romans in the first couple of verses, uh, Paul gives us a, a, a bit of a framework for what a global partnership and a short-term trip should be like. He's, he's writing to a country he hasn't been to yet, to a church that he hasn't yet visited. And he says in, in the uh, verse 11 and 12 of chapter one, I long to be with you, verse 12, so that I could be mutually encouraged. Um, we can be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. And that is such a foundational element of what you're going to be doing when you discover this wave of church planting sweeping through the country of Egypt. Um, Ten years ago, uh, there were, uh, I think Tharwat could probably give me more accurate statistics, but around 300 churches, um, evangelical Presbyterian churches in uh, the country of Egypt. Ten years later, there have been more than 100 churches and uh, uh, new church developments started. There is this movement of mission happening in the country. Egypt itself is becoming a hub of mission, sending missionaries uh, around neighboring countries. And those churches are going to come in a variety of shapes and sizes with a variety of resources and more developed um, uh, tourist uh, locations. You might see churches that 
uh, have similar resources to some of our uh, U.S. churches, but you also will see um, men and women of great faith uh, going to uh, the, the corners of Egypt that might be easy for uh, the average person to overlook. And I want to tell you a story of a new church development uh, along those lines. And we're going to go to uh, a neighborhood named Mawasset and uh, meet a pastor named Ekram. And Ekram came from South Egypt, Upper Egypt, to seminary and had uh, some uh, personal uh, discouragement and, and sadness in his life with his mother dying and uh, came into seminary limping, looking for grace and comfort um, uh, as he was exploring his studies. And he left with a sense of wanting to reach out to those who are also hurting and wanting his ministry to reflect what he received at the seminary. And so Ekram went to a neighborhood, a, a slum really, uh, outside of Cairo. This is a picture of what the streets look like uh, in this environment. It doesn't have any um, city resources. It, it really is uh, a group of people that found land they could live on and just started to, to, to uh, uh, build it up without any sort of civic engagement. And uh, Ekram went to this community. He graduated in 2013 and he showed up for a year, day in and day out with a soccer ball and some candy and tried to build relationships with kids. Um, and, and through those kids, he would play with them and meet their families uh, in the evening and built this community around him. And you can see Ekram has been gifted by God to bring joy to, uh, to children's faces. And after a year of investing like this, um, Ekram uh, had the first meeting of a church and there were 150 families that were present. And over time, as he continued to, to lead and pastor and shepherd this group of people, uh, he began to, to bring in resources and support, uh, a Sunday school program for the kids, a, a women's ministry, doctors from surrounding churches began to show up because there were no doctors or hospitals that would touch this community. And the, the impact, the visual demonstration of what the body of Christ looks like was so um, vast that there was even a Muslim businessman who invested his own finances in this church so that their impact could continue. And imagine uh, somebody that says, I don't believe what they believe, but I want to make sure they stay here because they're making our community better. What a, what a picture of God's grace uh, and of this movement sweeping through. When we um, visited uh, this church, you see on the left that there's this beautiful four-story building. And this is another picture of what the Outreach Foundation uh, can do in partnership with the Synod. Uh, the Outreach Foundation has uh, one of their mission statements. They want to expand the capacity of the global church. We don't want to come in and dictate. We want to see where God has called and is at work and expand the capacity of what God is doing. And so you can imagine um, a church with the resources like Ekram. Uh, you, you see he gets in touch with the Synod. The Synod finances this building turns around and partners with the Outreach Foundation to get in touch with congregations like you on this call. And men and women like us have been able to love this congregation well by, by providing some of the means for, for this building that now houses a medical clinic, uh, children's uh, uh, care programs, uh, and the sanctuary was being built when I visited. And I wanna draw your attention to the picture on the right. Uh, this uh, was one of the most moving things uh, that happened when we traveled. Ekram is holding a wedding ring. And he still remembers the day when uh, a woman came in uh, and took off her wedding ring and said, this was going to be my retirement strategy. You know, the, the, we don't have as much social security or, or support uh, in Egypt as some of us might be used to in U.S. Uh, culture. And she was holding on to this ring to take care of her funeral expenses when she died. And she said, I want this church to have it. I want to invest in what is going on in, uh, uh, in this community. I want to, to feel part of it. And I trust the church will take care of me when the time comes for me to go be with the Lord. Now, Ekram holds on to the ring because he obviously is not going to, to melt it down or, or anything like that. It's a powerful story of what God is doing, transforming lives uh, and having the community take part in the ministry that, that God started through Ekram. Today, uh, we just got an update in February and Ekram has transitioned to a new area. This church is thriving and stable and God has called him to start a new church development, uh, which is a, a strong demonstration of, of what's going on in this country where, where God is on the move and it's an exciting time. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Marilyn um, and we will come back to what I just showed you, which is the last bit of would you eat it? So, so stay tuned, we got some fun. Okay, friend, let's make sure I don't do what I did before, which is to get rid of 
you, there we go. We're cooking with grease, as we say. So picking up the story of, of new church development, um, because Egypt is obviously a very large place and we have, you know, maybe 10, 12 days on the ground. Um, we always have to be selective as to where we're going to go. And so, as I said, you know, the, the Cairo Seminary is always a base of operation where we spend a number of days, but then we take the guidance of Tharwat Wakba, who in addition, by the way, to being the professor of mission at the Cairo Seminary has been for a number of years the chair of the Ministry of the Synod that is involved with new church development. And so Tharwat will say, okay, this year your time will be spent, go north and see what's happening in Alexandria. This time when you come, go to the east and see what's happening in Hergada, where the tourist industry has attracted lots of workers. We're doing church planting there. Sometimes we go south to Luxor, to the city of Luxor, and not far from the city of Luxor, and I'll tell, talk more about that in just a minute, is a wonderful little village that Outreach Foundation um, became acquainted with through Tharwat, through the Senate of the Nile many years ago, the village of Adaima. And this is what it looks like. It is literally a little village. In some ways, it looks like a place where time stood still. That's not the Nile River, by the way, but that's one of the many little canals that trickle off of the Nile River that provide water for, um, particularly for irrigation um, amongst these agrarian communities. But in this little town of Adaima was a historic Presbyterian church that you almost might drive right by should you not notice that um, cross that's delineated in the old brickwork. This Presbyterian Church of Adaima was one of the focuses of the new church development of the Synod, not as a new church, but literally as a redevelopment of a, of a church that had been in the Synod for years and years and years, but through time, through history, the church had lost many of its members, many of them immigrating or moving up, I should say, to some of the large urban areas seeking work. And because the congregation got smaller, they could not afford a pastor. So the congregation began to shrink. The building, which was very old, as you can see, literally began to fall apart. And as Tharwat explained it to me, as the synod deliberated of what to do with many of these old churches, they realized that if they didn't pour resources into it, they would lose the footprint. They would lose the impact of the church in that place. And so the synod began to focus on these places, literally churches that were falling down around them and say, we know how to revive these. And that is to send new life into these places, new leadership in the form of a pastor, often a young pastor, newly minted out of seminary to come into these places and to breathe new life into them. In this particular case, this young, um, energetic young pastor, Reverend Shenouda Girgus, went to Adaima. He went there as a single man. When we first met him, by the way, he was single. And as we sat in this sanctuary with this congregation, with the building falling down around him, looking out at that very old village, I said sort of gently to him, has your fiance been here? Has she seen where she is moving? And, Sh and Shenouda said, yes, she has been here and she is falling in love with this place. Well, indeed, one of the things that she fell in love with, as we do, is this congregation. What was left in that congregation was largely older people, as you see here, but with Shenouda's arrival, it began to literally come back alive again. Families, young people began to flock to the church through the leadership of Shenouda. And indeed, when, when the Outreach Foundation team was there just last fall, not this in 2020, but in 2019, we saw the building literally being rebuilt, rising out of the ground with a new vision for ministry in this place. One of the wonderful joys, by the way, of gathering with these congregations in places like Mawasset or Zagazig or here in Adaima is as all good Presbyterians, wherever we gather, two or three of us, a chicken dies. You've all heard this adage. 
And that is true internationally as well. Gathering with this congregation in their very simple fellowship hall that it seems like all the food in the village was brought here for our purposes, to sit and share this meal, to share the joy of Christ together. And I have to share with you one of the, one, there was a small miracle that happened while we were there. And that is I was given a piece of bread that I recognized was in the miraculous shape of Mickey Mouse ears. And I thought this was a sign of some sort. It was not planned, but it was God's way of kind of putting his blessing upon this. And so I thought I would pose that for you. Some of the unexpected things that we have no idea are gonna happen when we show up to be with our family of faith. This was, as I said, taken on that last trip. This is now in the new sanctuary that is being rebuilt. All of those old mud bricks that are disintegrating now replaced with sturdy concrete blocks. Soon this will be faced and literally the old church takes on new life because of Shenouda. And speaking of new life, you see him there with his wife who's standing next to me, whose name is Angel, and indeed she is, and now three children. They are helping to repopulate this congregation of the Adima Church. One little kind of um, side conversation to have with you, kind of by way of contrast, because both Tim and I have concentrated on some of these smaller village churches, but I wanted you to be aware of the fact that the, that the, 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 content, or I should say the, the constituency of the Presbyterian Church in Egypt runs the gamut from those small village churches to large urban churches like this one. This is the Presbyterian Church in Heliopolis, which is in one of the kind of the upscale suburbs of Cairo that if I didn't have that labeling on the slide, you might think that looks like a church that could be found here. Everything in between in the spectrum of our Presbyterian family wanted you to kind of have that visual. One of the things that I wanted to share with you, because as I said, even though this is this virtual mission trip, we want to give you a little flavor about the ministry that we connect with, which of course is the heart of this trip. But we never ignore wherever we go, the history and the culture of the place where we are, because this is the framing of these congregations. This is the framing of our family, the context in which they live. And of course, in a place like Egypt, there is an incredible history to be embraced. And so we make time to, to touch base with all of the incredible um, historic landmarks in Egypt, including the, um, including the, um, the pyramids of Egypt, the Sphinx, as you can see here, the mandatory visit to the Cairo Museum, um, which by the way, is now soon going to be in competition with a brand new state of the art museum of antiquities that's being built with the help of the Japanese government. And every time we show up, we think maybe that will be the year that that new museum opens. It has not yet, but my heart is still drawn to this old historic museum that houses tens of thousands of the antiquities of Egypt, including, of course, the treasures of King Tutankhamun, which is one of the, uh, you know, one of the most famous um, collections of antiquities. Coming back to Luxor, I just mentioned to you that Adaima, this little village that we often visit, is not far from Luxor. It's about an hour and a half as we drive there through the small villages. But Luxor, of course, is famous for a number of things, not the least of which is the famous Valley of the Kings. That's where the tomb of King Tutankhamun was discovered. And so at looking across the river there, you see these beautiful sandstone um, cliffs at dawn where sometimes there are balloon rides that are taking place. But when we are in Luxor, of course, we make a visit to the Valley of the Kings to descend into some of these tombs. And one of the people that I want to introduce you to is the gentleman that you see there wearing the blue jeans and the blue shirt. That is Murad Setki. Uh, Murad is not only a fellow Presbyterian, a member of one of the Presbyterian churches in Egypt, but he is also one of the finest travel tour agents I have ever worked with. And so he has become part of our family, traveling with us, giving us 
absolutely expert um, guidance through all of these historic sites, taking care of us as if we were his family, because indeed we are. We are always in good hands when we're in Egypt with, with Murad um, in our midst. But going through these historic tombs, as many of you on this call have done, are quite spectacular. Of course, it is one of the great joys to, to visit the most famous tomb, which is that of King Tutankhamun, King Tut himself, as we've seen here, descending down into the burial chamber, which is, as I said, just a little glimpse of those incredible um, antiquities of Egypt. So one of the things that is also a great joy to visit in a place like Luxor are the great temple complexes. You know, Cairo was in Cairo, Memphis, things in the north part of Egypt were the capital of Egypt during the so-called Old Kingdom in the New Kingdom all of that shifted down here toward Luxor. And so in Luxor are two of the largest temple complexes ever built in pharaonic times, the most famous being the great temple of Amun, the sun god at, at Karnak, um, which we pay a visit to one of its most famous um, um, installations, we might say, is this famous hall. It's called the Hypostyle Hall that is filled with columns, massive, massive columns that impress upon you the great genius of the, the pharaonic builders. And it's also a chance as you tour this multi-acre site to just kind of sit, refresh, kind of drink it all in as our team has done here. I mentioned that when we stay in Cairo and we're in Cairo, our residency is always amongst family at um, Cairo Seminary. As we travel about the country, there are wonderful hotels that we stay in, in case any of you wonder what it's like to stay in Egypt. Of course, it has a thriving tourist industry, so that is not a problem. But sometimes we are gifted with a stay at some of the historic monuments of, of um, the hospital hospitality industry. One of my favorites is this one in Luxor, the Winter Palace Hotel, which is one of those great historic landmark hotels where people as famous as Winston Churchill would stay, where Howard Carter would come to meet with people as he was excavating the Valley of the Kings. But one of my favorite historical um, figures associated with the Winter Palace is the mystery writer Agatha Christie. Um, in fact, it is the, 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 the kind of the legend of Agatha Christie is that it was while she was at the Winter Palace Hotel that she wrote one of her most famous stories, namely Death on the Nile. And so you, this is the grounds of the Winter Palace. You saw the front of it. Here are the beautiful grounds where there that we often do our devotions as a team out here outside. But you can relax and refresh in the lounge and kind of envision yourself in here if you're so inclined maybe sipping a gin and tonic or having one of the local beers, Stella, and kind of debriefing the events of the day, but to imagine all of this history that swirls itself around you, or maybe sitting out on the balcony as the sun sets and reflecting on this incredible place, the history of Egypt. And yes, we have a touch point there because we have family, namely our Presbyterian family, in this place. Tim, going to hand things back over to you to talk a little bit about some of the other pleasures of being in Egypt. Yes, so it's real talk time. What are you going to survive off of when you visit a country you might not have visited before? And maybe you're like me and didn't want to be offensive, but you're just not sure what you're going to be asked to eat while you're in Egypt. So I just want to uh, prepare you and, and you can play a little game with me. Um, Egyptians are famous for their hospitality and you will have no shortage of food opportunities. So round one, we have some stuffed grape leaves uh, with some rice and some spiced meat. Should you want to uh, enjoy this delightful appetizer uh, before you sit down for your main meal, right? So kind of processing, is that something that I would want to eat? Uh, this one, uh, I think we might all get around is called fatir. It's a very thick pastry that you dip in the sweetest black molasses you will ever have in your life. Um, and uh, it is a, a wonderful way to put you right over the edge into nap time after dinner so that uh, you have a good conclusion to a nice meal. 
Um, here's one that uh, if you are a coffee lover of any kind, uh, ain't no coffee like uh, Turkish or Cyprian coffee with a little bit of rice pudding uh, to go with it as a, a little after dinner meal. This uh, is what I um, miss most about Egyptian food is, is proper coffee when I go to, to uh, sit down and talk with my friends. Um, but I wanna show you one that's, that's perhaps unique and this is a dish called dynamite. Uh, and this is a breakfast item in case you were wondering. So what you do is take uh, your fava beans that have been spiced uh, appropriately, um, a little bit of fried falafel, some potato chips. And for those of you that are vegetable oriented, you could put a tomato in there. I did not. Uh, and this uh, little uh, stuffing is placed in some Egyptian bread. And that's how you start your day, a nice ballast breakfast. Um, and so you've probably thought if I am gonna be eating like that, I'm gonna to need to be exercising or getting some kind of activities in my bones. So don't worry, we provide a workout regimen of trying to lift the pyramids while you're there. Um, this is an example of what not to do. Uh, Matthew and I thought we were gonna be so clever and take a photo of us holding up the pyramids. This is what we came up with. So uh, it clearly didn't work, but the Sphinx consoled us in our hour of shame and gave us a little encouragement before we left the pyramids. Uh, so I, I uh, playfully, when you guys are in Egypt, you're not going to have to worry about the taste or the adventure of the food. It is delicious. What you're going to have to worry about is, are you prepared to eat a lot of food for the sake of the kingdom? And what I want you to, to uh, prepare for is, is what a day in the life of visiting Zagazig Church was like for us. So I'm going to show you everything we had in one day's time. And you can just kind of begin to prepare your workout regiments accordingly. So a light breakfast. This is where we started in our hotel. A little hard-boiled egg, some cheeses, uh, bread and jam. Nothing too uh, extraordinary. We're ready to start the day. Everything's going great. Well, we want to have some chicken kebabs and uh, some nicely spiced rice and fries. That, that's a, a, a nice touch of a lunch. Um, as, as after we've uh, sat in on Sunday school, we've hung out with the kids a good bit in the church. Th this is a good lunch, but it's a little heavier. And so maybe we'll just have some relaxing afternoon time. We're going to go visit some homes in the city and connect with different families of the church. Don't worry, every home you visit is gonna give you one of these platters uh, and you don't get to put food on your plate. They put it on for you and they will make sure that you have one of every kind. Uh, and so it is a wonderful demonstration of hospitality. And you think, well, gosh, surely we're not going to eat dinner shortly after we have been welcomed so hospitably into these homes. Then you come to the church and there's a potluck. And I, I mean, this uh, pasta bechamel that you're seeing right in front of you with a cream sauce and, and uh, spiced beef is just out of this world. Same principle, this is what they're gonna put on your plate. So you've got chicken and uh, the fatir, a little bit of uh, a fried chicken cutlet, some delicious beef. I was in hog heaven after uh, eating this. And so we, we had a little uh, uh, late evening volleyball in the church in Zagazig after eating that meal. And we knew we were doing one more home visit and thought, surely we have had three full meals, three dessert platters, we're done. Except when we visited that home, uh, we had our fourth meal of the day. And it was at that point that I realized part of the spiritual preparation process for Egypt is going to be uh, a week of vegetables and fasting and juices so that I can really invest properly. Uh, I, I kid mostly um, because our Egyptian uh, friends are, oh, I forgot. Y'all, this is one more. Uh, we had one of our guests, uh, Tharwat, you're going to have to help me. What is this fruit that I'm looking at on the right? I think it's called caca or something like that. We'll ask Tharwat later. To the left, freshly yes, yes, pomegranate. Yes, this is uh, caca and uh, in the left it's uh, rumman. It's uh, pomegranate. Yeah. Pomegranate, yes. Yeah. So just delicious fruits. Um, and uh, uh, that's a lot of food. This is what our friend uh, Larry the Camel says. So um, what I want you guys to, to see is that coming to Egypt is like visiting family you didn't know you had. Um, they will shower you with uh, hospitality, with love, with food, and with stories of God's faithfulness that will quicken your heart uh, and uh, uh, knit you together so that you stand in support of what God is doing in that country, come back changed and equipped and transformed with how God might be at work in our own home local churches. And traveling with the Outreach Foundation is just an incredibly catalytic 
uh, uh, means of engaging what God is doing around the world and, and being changed by it. So if you haven't thought about traveling uh, with us before, uh, I encourage you to take Jesus up on his offer. Don't overthink and plan everything within an inch of its life. Just come and see and what God might have for you on the trip. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over uh, now. I think we have just open Q&A time and uh, any questions you might have, um, Marilyn and Tharwat will answer and I will just try not to make too many snarky jokes. So. And I know Kelly has been kind of tracking some questions, but and as she's kind of getting those together, a couple things to share with you. One is, first of all, thank you for being part of this. And as I mentioned, we're recording this. So within a short period of time, we'll have this up on our on the Outreach Foundation website. If you want to know more, really a flavor of a day by day traveling with the Outreach Foundation would invite you also back to our website into the kind of tabs at the at the top where it says learn, you can pull one down. That that says trips blog and you'll see daily blogs of all of the trips that Outreach Foundation has done around the world where day by day one of our travelers you know pulled down Egypt 2019 and you'll get a blow by blow of each of those days that gives a, a flavor. The other the last thing I want to say to you is that you know given everything that is going on in the world we don't know what travel possibilities are going to be before the year is out but we are kind of leaning forward in hope that by the end of this year we will be able to get back on the road again and and November has always been the traditional month that we go to Egypt. And so we are kind of talking hypothetically about a trip back to Egypt in November, probably departing around the 10th of, of November. Um, and as I said, please just keep an eye on our website or stay in touch with me um, to learn more about that. We haven't posted it yet, but we're dangerously close to getting that up because as I said, we're, we're, we're living in hope that maybe the conditions will be right by then that will allow us to be present with our partners. So Kelly, have you gotten in any questions that um, one of us can answer? Um, I'm looking, nobody's really popped into the chat quite yet uh, with questions, but uh, I mean, for me, Marilyn, how many trips have you taken to Egypt at this point? Wow, honey, you know, and I usually look that up before I come on. I'm probably somewhere in the 18 or 19 range. And one of the things a lot, and many of you know me, but not all of you know that my previous life before I was involved um, in Presbyterian mission is I taught Egyptian history and art history at the university for 20 years, did archaeology in Egypt. So this is kind of my home turf, which is also one of the reasons why we must visit all the antiquities while we're there. So um, so it's, it's a place that is delightful. It's a place that's familiar to me. And oh, by the way, we get to hang out with family. Kelly, and maybe you, let me just invite people, just unmute yourself and, and shout out a question. We're a you know, small enough group that that won't create too much chaos or make a comment on something. We'd just love to hear from you while we have uh, while we have a chance. We still have a little bit of time left. So don't be shy. Uh, I did just get a couple more questions in the chat. So let me uh, throw those at you. Um, so the first is from Glenn. He wanted to know, uh, was the Chuck, was the church in Luxor rebuilt? Um, so last time he was there, the government was wanting to excavate the site. The church has been rebuilt, and and what what Glenn Covington, who's a, a, one of our elder um, partners, um, who's been to Egypt, he's actually my walking buddy. We've done many dawn walks along the Nile together in Luxor, but the Presbyterian Church in Luxor was sitting on what they discovered was an archaeological site of an uh, avenue of rams leading up to one of the temples. And so the government says, we need to move you out of here so that we can excavate these th this ancient site. And there was a little bit of kind of acrimonious back and forth, but eventually things were resolved and a brand new church has now been built for the community there. So great question. And uh, we've got a question here for Tharwat, if he's still um, hanging out. Um, how Tharwat, are you still here? How are you, sir? Yes, yes, I'm here. So they're asking, um, how are things with COVID in Egypt? How yes, it's uh, in some places the people say, we hear something in the world that's taking place called COVID. What is this? But the reality is that it's very serious. 
And now we have what so, so called the third wave, and it's it's uh, spreading everywhere, and we see number of people affected. Some people are dying, um, but business is still the same. Uh, churches were closed for uh, during the Christmas time, but now they are open, and um, the seminary is online all the time since uh, last March. Uh, we don't have students on campus, so we follow up our, our teaching uh, online and we have regular meetings uh, via Zoom with our uh, students, but it, it is not a, a good thing to lose uh, the life <laughs> in, in, in the, the seminary. The vaccine has started to, to come, but it's very slow and uh, there are some priorities are taking place, uh, but the number that was uh, uh, a shot is, is very limited. So still the, the danger uh, is there in, in this uh, month. We hope when the summer comes, uh, things will, will get better. Yes. I'll hope them for that too. Um, so uh, Jen had another question for Tharwa um, while you're up. Uh, can you tell us about the growth and changes of the ministry of ETSC in, in recent years? Sure, uh, yes, uh, the, the, the number of, when we talk about, many aspects, the number of students grow from about 60, 70, now we have 520 students in all programs. We were in uh, one or two programs, now we have 10 programs. Uh, we were not accredited. This year we got accreditation from an European uh, 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 an institution for uh, accreditation. Uh, we, uh, we, we are starting to have a DMEN program with Fuller. We, we are thinking about a PhD in, in the region with other uh, 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 seminaries in, in, on, the, on the Middle East. Um, the faculty uh, members are growing. Uh, the facilities also is growing uh, re renovation all the time, but also an extension. And uh, we, we are uh, now opening, uh, softly opening our extension that is about 1300 square meters of offices and, and halls and housing and studio. And, uh, and, and it's, it's in the next building to the seminary, a whole floor. Uh, so uh, there is a growth in every aspect in the life of uh, uh, the seminary. And it happens also because of uh, your love and your support and your prayers. And we appreciate this uh, very much. Tharwat, can, let me just jump in and say one of the things I introduced Tharwat's um, professional affiliations in Egypt, but Outreach Foundation wants to take a little bit of um, pride in the fact that Tharwat is, is also part-time on staff with Outreach Foundation. So he came on board with us, um, I think last year or right before last year as a consultant with us. And so we have our own man in Cairo, we might say. Um, I mean, Tharwat's always been a great facilitator of our ministry, but now we're proud um, to also claim him a little tiny bit as part of, of the mission staff of the Outreach Foundation. So yay for us. Thank you. It's my, my pleasure. And I also, I, I am a product of the Outreach Foundation because through the Outreach Foundation, uh, my PhD studied, uh, studies uh, was uh, funded was from different churches. Merlin, Nancy, and, and Jeff uh, played a great role in that, and I appreciate this very much. Yeah, he turned out pretty well. So that was an investment well made. Kelly, I think we have time for maybe a couple quick questions. If you've got any? Got just a couple more. Um, so a couple quick questions about uh, trips with outreach. Um, length, what is the typical length or cost of the trip? I know the cost varies depending on um, travel expense and flights, but what's the typical length for the trip? Yeah, and that's a very good question. You know, typical length is about 12 days from beginning to end, and that includes travel because it takes two full days because you're going you know against the time zone so two days coming one day going so between you know 12 and 13 days gone and um you know ground costs usually range between 
you know, 2,200 and 2,500, and that's inclusive, you know, that's all our travel there, our meals, our transportation, and then airfare varies, you know, right now airfare is pretty cheap um, because no one is traveling, but, you know, on a typical year, and this won't vary a lot, you know, even going that far, you know, you can find decent flights, you know, in the 11 to $1,200 range, depending upon where you're coming from. Um, so as I said, looking ahead to next year, you know, we're still kind of finalizing the dates, but probably it will be somewhere departing around the 8th to the 10th, you know, mindful of the fact that we want to get everybody home well in advance of, of Thanksgiving. But, um, and if again, November doesn't allow for it, then we'll look at the earliest possible convenience the following year, but we're still praying we can do it. And uh, for those people who go on a trip, what's, what's the goal or hope once the travelers arrive home from Egypt? You know what, and that's a great question. You know, what we hope from that is, for whoever asked that question, is that relationships develop between you, your congregation, and between the church in Egypt. You know, to know your family there, to be in prayer with them, to be in partnership with them, and that can be a general partnership. You know, to know about the, 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 the work of the sem seminary, to partner with them, to know some of those students, the faculty, to know the work of the synod in that place. But there's also an opportunity. Some congregations come back and say, we want a, a really unique relationship relationship in Egypt, we would like to develop a sister church relationship. And Tharwat and um, his committee are really good at developing those as well. So there's lots of ways to kind of go deep or go broad, depending upon the, the goal of the congregation. Um, one of the other things, and Tharwat, I'm going to put you on notice here. I'm going to have you close this with prayer in just a minute, but I also want to extend a quick invitation um, for any of you who are in churches that are kind of exploring, boy, we, we would like to know more about this. I am happy to do a, a, an in-depth Zoom call with, with you, with your mission team. I do a lot of those, you know, come on for an hour or 45 minutes, meet with your mission team. Zoom provides a wonderful opportunity, you know, and venue for that at whatever time of day or night. And we can go a little bit deeper into really what it means to partner with Outreach Foundation, but to partner with us, through us, for the good of the development of the church in Egypt in relationships that are mutually encouraging, learning from the faith and faithfulness and in that way growing in our own discipleship as Tim set us up so beautifully. So friends, I wanna be sensitive. We just hit one o'clock. So Tharwat, will you unmute and pray us out of here and grateful to all of you for being part of this. In, in a month, we'll do another virtual trip, this one to Cuba. So look for, for information from outreach about that. So Tharwat, um, unmute yourself and pray us out of here, my dear. Sure, thank you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you the praise and the glory because you are the one who united us through the death and resurrection of your son to put us in one body all over the world. We are the body of Christ. And thank you, Lord, for the fellowship we are having in this body as we are encouraging, supporting, praying for each other. As we see your work, Lord, your hand is mighty and your spirit is in, in the move. In Egypt, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Europe, in, in the States, everywhere, you are an active God. And we have the privilege to go after you where you are working and to share you in your love and giving peaceful and loving message for the world which is in need. Thank you, Lord, for this time, for this trip, for uh, the time we spent, for the churches we visited, the seminary we enjoyed with, the food we looked at, the hopes that we one day we will uh, rejoin, that we will visit, that we will see each other. Soon, Lord, everything will, will be according to your will, and we are looking, Lord, for a, a, a deeper connection with each other and that we, we, we may support and love and encourage each other, each one in, in his life and in his mercy. I, I pray for a blessing upon all my brothers and sisters in this call and also upon our churches, the churches we represent, 
upon the church in Egypt and the challenges we are facing, that everything will be uh, uh, under your control. I pray for the Outreach Foundation and the uh, uh, coming days that uh, soon, Lord, everything will be uh, better and that we will be united again and we will be able to come and see and visit uh, each other. I, I, I put the results of this call in your hands as I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear ones. Waving goodbye to all of you. Thanks again. Blessing. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.